After the Apocalypse, a pandemic survival story. Season 2, Episode 16, Ghosts. John Tasker lifted his head to the sounds of hurried footsteps approaching the door. He was in the middle of a meeting with Carl and Michael in the improvised gym office. They were going through the week's schedule. John Tasker liked to stay on top of things. A man dashed into the room, breathless. We're being attacked, he shouted, cramming the words together in a frenzied effort to get them all out quickly, turning the three separate words into a single interjection. Calm down, Kevin, Tasker said. Take a breath and tell us what's happening. Let's not hurry up and screw up. Kevin tried to calm himself. He took a breath as instructed by the older man and began more slowly. Two Humvees full of our men just crashed into the parking lot and they're threatening Noah. Michael, the ex-Marine, spoke up. Boss, we should round up the rest of the crew and make sure we're ready if this turns ugly. Tasker patted Michael's arm and responded calmly. We won't let it get ugly, Mike. I'm sure it's just a misunderstanding. Lots of folks have been wandering in the desert and think this is their oasis. Once we explain to them that they found the new Jerusalem, I'm sure they'll set down their guns. They'll be happy to join us in rebuilding this great country. Why would they want to attack us when we can give them everything they need? And more than that, we can give them what they've lost, government, morality, and a future. Tasker paused and then summarized for his audience. Why would anyone attack us? That'd be un-American. Carl leaned into the discussion and reinforced Tasker's speech. The boss is right. We are the land of plenty, the land of milk and honey. They just need the boss here to explain it to them. It'll all work out for the best, just like he says. Carl patted his ample belly with a self-satisfied grin. I don't know, Michael replied. I think we should be ready. Hope for the best, plan for the worst and all. I'm going to make sure the others know what's going on and get them ready. You go ahead and do what you need to do, Michael. But like Carl said, it'll be fine. Tasker smiled. It's a joyous day. Our tribe of God-fearing Americans is growing. Carl piled on like a sycophant. Yes, sir. It's all going to be fine. A joyous day. Let's go outside and have that conversation. The staccato crack of rifle shots shattered the moment. Tasker frowned. Michael unsnapped the holster of his pistol, pulled it out, and shoved it in the direction of Tasker. Here, take this. Tasker looked at the preferred weapon like he didn't see it and said, No, I don't need a weapon. My weapon is righteousness. I'm the law here. His face was awash with righteous belief. But there was something else, some cracklings of uncertainty, the small, scurrying lines of fear like cockroaches invading the walls of a fortress. Carl bolstered his boss, parroting Tasker. Yeah, he's the law here. They'll understand that. Michael shrugged with uncertainty. I'm going to get the men. He set off at an urgent jog towards the back of the building. Carl grabbed Tasker's arm and pulled him to his feet. Come on, boss. Let's go explain the situation to these guys. Willie sat on an empty wooden crate. Beside her was the woman. Willie had dragged the woman to the old recliner she sometimes slept in. It wasn't easy. The woman was heavier than Willie had expected and dead weight. Willie suddenly realized how tired she was. She fought off a big yawn. It had been a long day. Instinctively, she laid an old comforter across the shivering woman in the chair and smoothed it out loosely. It seemed like the right thing to do. She remembered hearing about the danger of, what was it, hypothermia, but she really didn't know much about it. She supposed that if she was at the old library in Atlanta where she had spent her afternoons, she could Google it. Back before the end of the world, when Googling was a thing, 
An odd thought about the persistence of anachronistic language in the book she read forced its way into her brain. Words died hard in societies. She wondered how long it would take for humanity to forget what Google meant. How quickly would it fall out of use? A few years, a few generations, or had it become so deeply embedded in the language that humans would go on using the term as a synonym for searching, but forget why? Would the next generation of survivors go out Googling for food? She didn't know. Where did these thoughts even come from? She shook her head. In the four months or so since she'd had to navigate the apocalypse, the old world was already starting to fade. That world felt less and less real every day, like it had been a dream, and now she was awake in this new dead world. Or was this nightmare world a dream? It was hard to tell. The woman in the chair next to her shifted in a tremor and mumbled something unrecognizable, somewhere between a moan and a word. Janet was delirious. Her core body temperature had dropped to a point where her systems were beginning to shut down. Her cold, befuddled brain cast about desperately for reality. Disconnected images fluttered through her semi-consciousness. She had beaten death so far, but was still teetering on the edge of the abyss. She almost lost the battle in the river, but her mother had appeared to inspire her to keep going, to keep fighting, to fill her with spirit. And she had kept fighting, but now she was fading away again. Through the waves of delirium, her mother's image began to emerge again. Misty and ragged at the edges, that kind old face creased with smile lines, that same face that Janet had shrouded and buried just a few short months ago. It seemed to be more than just a memory, more like a presence, not physical presence, a ghost. The ghost of her mother was with her again. Janet cried in her fever dream. Mom, I'm sorry for not being strong enough, for not believing, for not having faith like you. The ghostly image drifted closer and smiled that wonderful, warm smile. Be still, child. Don't waste your tears. Look at you, my sweet daughter. The ghost of her mother tucked a warm blanket around Janet's shoulders. Let's get you warmed up. Look at all you've been through. So brave, so courageous. I've never had your courage, baby Jane. I love you, Mom. I'm cold. I'm tired. I failed. I don't have your strength. Janet cried hot tears. The woman mumbled something slurred and incoherent, and it snapped Willie back from her wool-gathering. Willie didn't know about hypothermia, but she could see this woman was cold and made the leap of logic that the best thing to do was to keep her warm. Willie could have let the woman die, but something inside her told her to care for this woman. Keep her warm until she decided to stay or go. To stay here in the apocalyptic fight for survival that the world had become. Or move on to join the millions already dead. Willie stoked a small stove with chunks of wood stripped from old shipping pallets. The old pallets made great wood stove fuel, especially the ones made from hardwood. The wood was seasoned and cured from years of use. It was dry and easy to light. It burned hot and didn't make much smoke. The woman in the chair was talking again, slurred words that didn't make much sense. She was having a conversation with someone, but it wasn't Willie. The woman sobbed and moaned in her delirium. Tears ran from her eyes. Willie rummaged out a pot to make some broth soup. That's what her aunt had fed her when she was sick. It didn't have many calories, but it was salty, warm, and easy to digest for the weak and sick. Willie poured water into the old aluminum percolator coffee pot that she used. 
That percolator was certainly older than she was. It may have been older than her aunt. The type of thing you'd find in a flea market for a dollar. She put a few bullion cubes into the mesh basket where the coffee would go and set it on the stove. The sick woman raised her voice a bit and thrashed. Willie put her hand on the woman's brow and smoothed the wet hair back. Stay with me, lady. Have faith now. You need to hold on to your faith. That's what Annie would say. She couldn't tell if the woman was winning or losing her battle, but she was still talking to her ghosts. My sweet baby Jane. The image of her mother was blurred and tinged red at the edges and swam in and out of focus like a weak TV signal. You haven't failed. You brought your sweet courage to this world. Her mother reached out a ghostly hand and smoothed the hair from her brow. Rest now and hold fast to that courage. I can't do it, Mom. Janet sobbed and shook her head. Of course you can, baby Jane. A woman of courage is also a woman of faith. All you need is faith. Faith is the bird that feels the light when the dawn is still dark. The warm image of her mother faded in a swirl of orange mist that seemed to fall into itself like water down a drain. Janet smiled. She's talking to ghosts. Ghost, Willie thought. This was a ghost world now. The woman shook her head in her fevered dreams, and Willie laid the back of her hand on the woman's flushed cheek. It was an instinctive gesture. Willie was surprised to feel emotions rise up inside herself, a nascent feeling of... How could she describe it? Kindness? No, deeper and more personal than kindness. Empathy, then. No, empathy was too clinical. What had her auntie always said? Love. That was the word auntie spread around as a catch-all for everything in the human world. Love but not in a physical or romantic sense. Her auntie's love was a community love, an ocean of love they all swam in. It was a tenant of auntie's faith. There was something about physical presence and touch that communicated this human love. Physical touch sent waves of this primal, communal love in both directions of the bond. It was something built into humans that allowed them to be stronger together than on their own. Stronger together. Willie chewed that sentiment over in her head. She considered the woman whose hand she now held. The hand didn't seem as cold as it had been. The percolator rattled and sputtered and finished with a boiling burp on the stove. Maybe... Her need for isolation was misplaced. Maybe what she really needed was to be with other humans for this, for the physical, communal belonging that her bricked-up fortress could not provide. Maybe all that bluster about being strong and independent and alone was really fear. That was a powerful thought that hit her like a slap to the face. Maybe it was fear and her desire to try to control something in this out-of-control world. She poured the hot broth into a chipped but clean ceramic mug with the happy logo of some real estate agent who was probably long dead. Willie carefully dipped a spoon into the broth, gathered it to her lips and blew steam from it. She lowered it to the mumbling woman's lips. The woman drank reflexively. She coughed a bit, and Willie wiped the brine from her chin with her own shirt sleeve. Michael paused at the door for the briefest moment. He took a quick glance out the front window, shook his head, and ran down the corridor towards the back. His boots made a loud clomping noise on the linoleum that echoed off the walls. His nerves were on edge, and the sound seemed over-amplified to his heightened senses. He stopped to unlock the door. He dashed inside, unlocked a gun cabinet, and began shoving weapons and ammo into a large canvas bag with a picture of a regal eight-point buck and the name Stagmaster on it. 
he wasn't after any trophy deer to brag about to his friends over beers at the local VFW. He was thinking about survival. He didn't have time to be picky. He just grabbed what he could, left the door ajar, and continued towards the back. Michael thought that, in general, Tasker had the right idea, but he was a little less than professional when it came to situation assessment. He believed in Tasker's vision, even though he wasn't completely sure about the man. Michael's combat experience told him that it's always best to be prepared. The Marines took that idea a giant step further than the Boy Scouts. Michael wasn't going to lose everything they had built here because Tasker failed to be prepared. And to protect Tasker's vision and their home, he needed to move. Michael was on his radio now as he hurried with the unwieldy bag dragging at his shoulder. We got a situation. I need every able body to meet me at the back door of the admin building right now and bring a gun if you have one. Then he added for urgency, this is not a drill. Move as if your life depends on it and avoid the front. Meet me in the back, balls to the wall. He paused at an open office door and saw Brad out of the corner of his eye. The kid was working on inventory spreadsheets at a computer. Come with me, kid, and make it quick. Michael dropped the heavy pack on the floor, fished out an old Remington 12-gauge, and shoved it into Brad's hands. Brad looked equal parts confused and concerned. Michael handed him a box of buckshot shells. Put four in the gun, put the rest in your pocket, pump it to load. Don't forget the safety. Brad still looked confused. Jesus! Just point it at the other guy and try to look mean and don't shoot yourself. Let's move. By the time they reached the back parking lot, men were arriving in singles and pairs. Soon there were 15 or so, and Michael motioned them together for instructions. Okay, we've got potential hostiles at the front. Tasker's talking to them, so don't get trigger happy, but be ready for a show of force if we need it. He paused and assessed his men. He pointed, George. Take these five and move around to the west side of the building. Roger, take these five and go around the east. Nobody shoots until I say so. Just approach to about 50 feet from the front and hold your position. Make sure they see you so they know they're flanked and outnumbered. He continued, Frank, Miguel, you go up and join the guys on the roof. Don't shoot unless I say so. Make yourself seen. Then get behind the sandbags and be ready to cover us if something starts. Kid, what's your name? Brad, you come with me. He looked at the men. Any questions? No. Good. Move it. The group separated into four squads, moving double quick. John Tasker pushed the glass door to the building open and stepped through it into a pool of sunlight. Carl was right behind him. What seems to be the problem here, boys? he said slowly and calmly, like a school principal who had just come upon a pair of tussling teens in the schoolyard. Noah was on the ground. A lanky man in a leather vest was standing on his neck. The metallic sulfur smell of recent gunfire was in the air. Tasker addressed the rat-faced man. Now, son, can you please take your foot off Noah here and let me explain your good fortune to you? Harlan looked amused. He shrugged, stepped back, and casually leaned against a Humvee. Go ahead, Bubba. Tell us why it's our lucky day. Someone snickered behind him. Tasker cleared his throat and began to speak. Boys, today is your lucky day. It's everyone's lucky day because I, John Tasker, represent the United States of America. Tasker paused here like he was expecting applause. And what we're doing here is remaking everything we love. We are rebuilding this great land, and you, yes, you, get to be a part of it all. He smiled and spread his arms out, embracing his grand vision of the future. Harlan shifted a bit and asked with an ironic grin, Does that mean we get breakfast? I could have sworn I smelled waffles. Someone choked back a laugh behind him. Tasker's smile twitched imperceptibly, but he continued, What that means, my friend, is you get back everything you've lost. You get back Tennessee, and you get back America. You get to be a part of the great recovery. Just then, 
Two more men appeared on the roof with rifles and ducked behind the sandbags. Harlan stiffened. Listen to me, John. Harlan let the name hang in the air like it tasted bad. There ain't no getting back to the old world. And to be honest with you, it never was so good to me. So how about you have your men put their guns down and we all go get us some breakfast? Two groups of armed men appeared around each side of the building and jogged to a stop. The men on the outer edges of the Humvees turned to face them. Michael walked through the door behind Tasker, with Brad shuffling nervously behind him. Tasker spoke, more slowly and seriously than before. Boys, we don't want any more trouble. Put your guns away. Come on now. Work with us to build back what we've lost. Harlan stepped forward again and shook his head sadly. What are we going to do about this? Looks like we got one of them Mexican standoffs. The screech of a hawk broke the silence. Harlan looked up at the large dark raptor circling on the thermals above the parking lot, being harassed by a couple of jays. Harlan smiled, and with no hint of tension in his voice, he asked, What do you think we should do, Carl? Carl stepped forward as Harlan spoke. In one quick motion, he grabbed Tasker's neck and shoved the barrel of his Glock into Tasker's ear. Tasker's confidence shattered like a windshield dinged by a lump of Appalachian coal off the back of a triaxle. A small crack of confusion quickly expanded into a web of dismay and disappointment. Through gritted teeth, Carl announced loudly to all assembled, I think you all should do what Harlan says or I spray Mr. Tasker's head all over this parking lot. Hello, my survivor friends. Here we are at the end of episode 16, season 2. Glad you could join us for you time travelers. Listening in the future, it's the end of March 2022. As a matter of fact, today, as I record this, it is April 1st, April Fool's Day. And we're running at about 10,000 downloads a month still. It leveled off a bit in February, so... That means it's time for you, for you, yes, you, to earn your keep again and go give us that rate and review. Go rate and review an episode for us. And tell your friends, help us help you. <laughs> All right, so we got lots to talk about this week. For the Facebook group, we're up over 130 folks. So at least I have some people to talk to when I'm bored. We've created a couple fun events for the team. The first one is our Read Some Audio Contest. Yeah, we're going to have you read some audio. In this contest, not really a contest, kind of a fun thing. So we gave out a short two-sentence story and had people submit their audio renderings of it. And our crack editorial team, not me because I hate making decisions, our crack editorial team will choose a winner. And that winner will get to, or maybe have to, read a story that I've written into audio, and we'll post that as an extra credit episode on the podcast feed in between seasons, because we're getting close to the end of season two. And if you uh, talented writers or readers want to send something in to fill this vast, yawning, dark, cavernous, empty void that is the between season time, as the Romans would say, the interregnum, Give me a shout out at CYKT Russell. That's Chris Yellow King Tom Russell with two S's, two L's at gmail.com. And also in the Facebook group, I posted a couple pictures of the stickers that I bought from our T Public store. And they're kind of cute. And those links are in the show notes as well. If that wasn't enough. <laughs> We're kicking off another feature, or I am anyhow. It's called Fan Art Friday, where I'm going to drop in some uh, some art every Friday. And I would love any of you to contribute. If you got something you want to contribute, go ahead. We'll post it up. I mean, you folks know the characters better than anybody else if you've made it this far. 
and you'd create killer art and you'd create it with love and I'd love to see that because it is interesting to see how people uh, for example to see how everyone has a different idea of what Bill the Dog looks like right you know so do I have any of you starving artists out there any illustrators any creatives that want to do that have some fun with it and we'll post it up because I do have like 20,000 social followers uh, on the interwebs and I'll give you a shout out on the show even if you do that so anyhow we did it yeah we're we're are almost did it we're four more episodes to survive and we're there two months away from the end of season two if we stay on track and let that be a lesson to you kids consistency is your secret weapon right we just started this what 16 months ago and now we're about 120,000 words in and the why you care is because that just shows you, you know, you push out a little bit consistently, it piles up and you get to where you need to be. But I won't kid you, it takes some work, right? And some money, uh, mostly time. <laughs> Each episode probably takes, I don't know, five or six hours of my creative time. And that's just me. I steal a couple hours from my friendly editorial board, Dwayne, Tim and Dave as well. Then Robert does his magic and reads the episodes, performs the episodes, which leads us up to another discussion because as much work as this show requires and as much of a labor of love it is, we do it because we love it. If you want to produce a real audio drama with actors and sound effects, that's next level work. For this topic, I'm going to steal from a post on our Facebook group by Gail, where she reminded me of a podcast that I had forgotten about. And this podcast in question is called We're Alive. And it's a zombie apocalypse podcast that is a nice piece of audio theater. And We're Alive is an early show. It started in 2009. Casey Whalen started that, and it ran till 2014. And in podcasting years, that makes it one of the original, the old school, the OG, before podcasting was even a real thing. And this show, this We're Alive show, is a full-on audio theater piece with characters and voices and Foley sound effects. The backstory is, Casey Whalen was shopping a script for a zombie apocalypse TV show. He didn't get any takers, couldn't sell it, so he said, okay the heck with you guys I'll just turn it into my own audio theater piece and they produced four seasons of 30 to 40 episodes at a production rate of like three episodes a month which is crazy because creating audio theater is really hard let me let me explain it to you you start with a script right each one of these we're alive we're alive scripts for for Casey Willens uh creation here, each one of these episodes would be 60 pages long. By comparison, what you just listened to from me was about 8 pages long. Then, after that, you have to bring in the voice actors to a soundstage for 6 to 8 hours of them just recording the script, the raw audio. And then that gets cut up into usable audio chunks by an editor. And then another editor sticks it all together so it makes sense. Then still another editor, editing, editing pass anyhow, puts in the music and the Foley sound effects. I mean, even if you're doing it in L.A. where you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a starving actor, it's still a big lift. And so I listened through this podcast, the first four seasons of it, a couple of years ago, and I found it interesting. I particularly liked how they adapted the TV scripts to the audio audience, because if you pay attention, you'll hear them doing a lot of exposition in the dialogue. They'll say things like, look, he's running towards us, <laughs> or he's not dead, or things like that, because they have to they have to tell you what's going on, because they don't have the visuals, right? And they don't want to rely too much on the third person voiceover. So I liked it anyhow when I listened to it, and I had forgotten about it until Gail posted on the Facebook group. So thank you, Gail. There are two sequel series now called Lockdown and Gold Rush that you'll find on the same podcast feed for We're Alive. And I'm listening to Lockdown right now, and it's very similar to the original. 
So kudos to KC Whalen for chasing his dream back in 2009 and making We're Alive a reality. That's the beauty of independent publishing. You don't need permission to create. The internet, it's cut out the middlemen for those of us who just want to create stuff. Freedom! You can join our Facebook group by searching for After the Apocalypse or Old Man Apocalypse. You can email me at cyktrussell at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter or Instagram at cyktrussell. But usually I just post pictures of my dog, Ollie. So I don't know if you're interested in that. <laughs> you can find our Tee Public store to buy some of those cool stickers at Tee Public, all one word, forward slash, after the apocalypse. We've got a Patreon page as well. If you'd like to support independent podcasting with a monetary donation, the most helpful thing you can always do is rating us and posting a positive review or sharing the show with your social networks. All the links to all these things are here in the show notes. Have a great weekend, and whatever you do, keep surviving. Surviving.